President's podcast right here on the record with the Ohio Senate. The views, the news excludes. I'm your host, the director of communication for the Republican caucus in the Senate, the majority caucus. I'm John Fortney. Joining us this week on the President's podcast, Ohio Senator Rob McCauley, a Republican from Napoleon, Ohio. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here, John. It's good to have you back. Uh, Senate Bill 215 passed off the Senate floor this week, and it really addressed contributions, and it's hard to kind of get your head around this at times, but what it did, it addressed contributions coming to issue campaigns into Ohio that would originate from outside of the United States. How big of a threat is that becoming to the way that we conduct elections in Ohio? Well, I think it's a big threat, and it's a growing threat, not just in Ohio, but across the country. Um, and it's something that has been on the books as far as candidate elections are concerned since all the way back in 1972 for federal races and all the way back in 2000 for state races. Um, something that has been, uh, you know, people have acknowledged that long ago, we don't want federal, or excuse me, foreign money in our elections for candidates. Well, in some cases though, the, these large dark money groups from outside of the state of Ohio and in some cases from outside the country have found a loophole and have found another way around the law for issues campaigns. Um, and so what we're seeing across the entire country is a growing trend of foreign dark money coming in in favor of issues campaigns um, to the tune of tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars across the United States. Ohio alone received last year in 2023 alone about $13.5 million from one entity, the 1630 Fund, that has been funded with almost a quarter billion dollars from a Swiss billionaire named Hans-Jörg Bies since 2016. This is a true and real and present threat to Ohio's election systems. And regardless of what side you're on, regardless of what you think should happen in these issues elections, you should all, we should all be able to agree that we don't want foreign influence in our elections. Well, when you have $61 million going to, I think it was the issue one campaign in November, and all it takes is a simple majority to find yourself a place in the Ohio Constitution, $61 million goes a long way to getting that done, even on getting yourself on the ballot. Yes, yes, a a a absolutely. And so, um, you know, let me be clear, these results of these elections may not have, ma it may not have made a difference whether they received this foreign money or they didn't receive this foreign money as to what the end result would have been uh, on election night. But I think it, it bears repeating though that more transparency is needed and we need to demand that our elections are influenced only by people, only by citizens who are gonna have an actual interest. Well, in you this. put your finger on it when you say citizens because to vote in the state of Ohio, you have to be a registered voter and a citizen of the state, correct? Correct, if, if you are going to be um, influencing, it, if, you, if you are gonna vote in the state of Ohio, you have to be a citizen under our constitution. And a citizen of the United States. Yes, yes. Unlike certain, like I think in some cases, uh, in places in New York maybe, also in California, their local elections allow non-American citizens to vote. How big of a danger do you think that is to the foundation of the United States Constitution and to how we conduct our political system in general? Well, I, I think you have to ask why there's even a push for that sort of thing to happen. Um, it's puzzling as to why we would want non-citizens um, of the state or the country to have the opportunity to vote in our elections. It's been long-standing principle since our country was founded that you had to be a citizen uh, not only of the jurisdiction in which you live, whether that be your township, your city, your state, your county, uh, but also of this country to be able to cast a ballot in our elections. And that's all about having free, open, and fair, and transparent elections that the citizens can have faith in. And when we start adding the, the ability for non-citizens to vote, and Ohio, thankfully, has, has taken care of that in a constitutional amendment, um, it begins to, to add a little bit of a level of, in some cases, maybe unfairness, and certainly begins to impact the confidence that the Ohioans have in their elections. We hear a lot about dark money, 
these days, dark money this, dark money that, both sides of the aisle and dark money. What are your thoughts on dark money? Maybe just start with what dark money really is when we say 501c4. And that's really governed and regulated by federal law, is it not? Correct. So when, when you form an organization um, and, and, and you, you basically say, hey, we're going to form, even if it's an ongoing corporation, and if you and I went into business and we said, hey, we're going to, we're going to form McCulley and Fortney Contracting, um, we are electing to be taxed under a certain chapter of the tax code, okay, whenever we form our business. When we say 501c3 or 501c4, those are sections of the tax code that designate that this entity is a nonprofit ongoing business. And so what's happened here over of late and it started with the Citizens United uh, Supreme Court decision out of the Supreme Court of the United States, is that Citizens United, in that case, the Supreme Court of the United States acknowledged that corporations have First Amendment rights to, uh, to voice their opinions and to engage in political discussion just as much as normal living human beings do. And so as a result of that decision that came out and said you cannot exclude corporations from political activity, um, we've seen a rise in 501c4s, uh, which are nonprofits that are not tax deductible, um, 501c4s that are raising boatloads of money and they're putting it into political advocacy across the country. Now these 501c4s don't, do not have to disclose their donors as far as campaign finance uh, disclosure laws are typically concerned. And so that's why it's called dark money because it's without disclosure in many cases. In some cases in state laws, like for example, if you are an official ballot campaign, Ohio law requires you for a ballot initiative to disclose your donors. Um, and so much has been made out of, for example, uh, the billionaire out of Illinois mm -hmm. who decided to to donate to campaigns last year in Ohio on one side of the issue. Uh, but his name was disclosed. His name showed up on the campaign finance reports. His name was there front and center for everybody to see. And um, naturally he, he received a lot of grief for that. On the other side of the, the, the coin, dark money reigns supreme uh, uh, primarily uh, in, in some of these issues where it was a tangled web of dark money that concealed the ultimate source of the money where it came from and in one case it was the 1630 fund uh, where through uh, examination of 990s which are the, the tax returns that get filed by these these nonprofit entities those 990s have showed that those entities have received foreign money. And you know, yeah, you know where it comes from and you know where that originates and who started the fund out of Switzerland. Correct. So I'll say it, you don't have to say it, but it's almost like we have unlimited funding and we can launder it through our national organization. But in Ohio, that's why it's important to have Senate Bill 215 so you know that that's illegal, prohibited, yeah. and there's a penalty for doing so. Do you, think it, do you think it's a high enough bar to discourage that practice? Well, it, it's, it's going to discourage the foreign contributions for sure. Um, it, it may not get completely at the issue of dark money. Um, that's a conversation for another day and, and something that I think is worth us delving into a little bit deeper. Um, but the immediate issue here was the, the fact that we had verified, and it was well reported, that foreign money is coming into Ohio's elections. And so the, what the bill would do is it would say, if you are an entity that has received foreign contributions from, from a foreign national in this case, then that entity would be prohibited from uh, contributing to Ohio elections for issues campaigns. They're already for, prohibited for candidate elections for issues campaigns unless they set up a segregated fund that basically was a clean, untainted, account that they would then have to report dollar one income and dollar one expenditures throughout the campaign. So we would be able to satisfy uh, to the Ohio voters that there was no foreign money coming from this entity in these Ohio campaigns. One of your colleagues on the Democratic on the other side of the aisle uh, pushed back on the floor this week saying that this would actually force Little League organizations and other small community groups and sport groups to register as a PAC. There seems to be 
a, a gulf of difference by definition of the Girl Scout troop or the Little League baseball, whatever it is, and the 1630 fund. Yeah, I, I think it was, it was a little bit of hyperbole thrown out by uh, my good friend on the, on the other side, Senator DeMora, uh, just to try to gin up a, 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 a reasonable basis for them to vote no on this. Because let's face it, they don't want to vote no on this. Um, but the, the actual truth is when what we required in the bill and what we a eventually did was we're requiring parity in the spending from these campaigns, from these ballot initiative campaigns, with what would be required for candidate elections. That's the same thing we're doing with the foreign money. We're, we're requiring parity that foreign money cannot be spent in these elections. We're doing the same thing from dollar one. So if I were to go out and I were to run for village council, township trustee, county commissioner, uh, you know, any one of those races, no matter how big or small, state senate, state governor, as soon as I start raising money, as soon as dollar one comes in in support of my campaign efforts, and as soon as dollar one goes out in support of those efforts, even before I've even collected a signature on a petition, I am required to uh, disclose those donations and disclose those expenses so there can be transparency in our campaign finance. Current law doesn't require these ballot initiatives to disclose their expenditures or their contributions until they've actually gotten on the ballot. And I can tell you in many cases those those expenditures in some cases can be millions of dollars. Very costly for, to run a petition drive. Very costly in, in a statewide ballot initiative. And so we deserve as Ohioans to know who's funding these efforts and even at the local level. Okay, because this, this, this very well could uh, apply to these local ballot initiatives. But let's, again, let's make sure we understand this is nothing more than what we're requiring of our candidate elections and our candidates who try to get on the ballot in that even if I'm, run, if, even if I'm running, the example that Senator DeMora used was if I just buy t-shirts and some pizzas to get people energized, I'm going to have to disclose that I spent money on this campaign. Well, if I'm running for village council in a village of 800 people and I just buy t-shirts and pizzas to try to get people to vote for me, I got to disclose that money that came in and those expenditures that were made. We're putting everybody on an equal playing field in that if you are trying to use money to influence Ohio elections, you're going to have to disclose, uh, in this case, your, where your contributions came from, and also you're going to have to disclose how you spent your money. Really busy floor week this week, several issues on the floor, one of which was a floor amendment to House Bill 27 that dealt with capital budget projects, $600 million for public schools, $575 million for public works. The governor asked $196 million that we put in there, the Senate put in for the state fairgrounds projects. And then something that wasn't capital budget but general revenue fund related was uh, $38 million for the adoption grant program. I want to talk about the importance of this program. It was initially changed last year year in 2023 from a tax credit program over to a grant program where it gave $10,000 to a family for a basic adoption, $15,000 to adopt a child out of foster care, and to adopt a child with disabilities that was $20,000. The initial funding was $15 million and basically it was so successful it was depleted and we made the new appropriation. How important is that program? Well, in my mind this is a good problem to have quite frankly, is because ultimately the aim of that program is to make sure that these children have an opportunity to wind up in loving homes and they have an opportunity to grow up in a loving home that's going to support them and allow them to develop and become a, a good good contributing citizen and be surrounded by parents that, that, want, that love them and want them to be successful. And so that's what, that's what the program is aimed at doing and we're actually very pleased at the amount of demand for those dollars that's come through. And the whole program was created because of the fact that it is, in some cases, burdensome and expensive for a family to go through with an adoption and try and uh, get to the point where they're going to be able to actually adopt that kid and bring them into their home. And we thought, look, if we're going to be supportive of these kids, especially these kids who in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, um, 
have been put into circumstances outside of their control and are in need of uh, a new uh, a family that's going to provide them with the love and the support that they uh, so, so desperately need in some cases, then we need to be uh, at the front line of trying to incentivize that and also trying to make it easier for those families to go through that process. So, like I said, it's a great problem to have that we have this many families that are willing to step up and proceed with those adoptions. And House Bill 27 then would go back to the House. The other chamber obviously would have to approve the or concur with the amendment. There seems to have been a lot of confusion and confusing narratives out there regarding the current capital budget process. And when the Senate included what the House did in House Bill 2, included the capital budget pro projects for school, school construction and public works, uh, that's something that they passed as part of their House Bill 2 uh, that also received a fair amount of criticism about the timeline. And I should step back and say the capital budget is something that happens traditionally every two years. And the Senate issued its guidance for the capital budget application projects for where uh, public entities and also private entities would come and say, these are, the, these are the projects that we would like to submit an application for your consideration to fund them. That takes several months, and correct me if I'm wrong, normally, normally, both the House and the Senate get together, leadership reviews all the projects, vets them, says, yes, this is a good project, this qualifies, maybe this one doesn't, and then it's constructed into one bill. That process didn't happen. So, what are your thoughts about moving forward? Because the schools and the public works seem like those are always long-standing projects. They're always well vetted because they're public entities and we know where the money's going. Mm -hmm. So typically you are correct. I've been in the legislature since 2015 when I was elected to the House, served in both the House and the Senate. And the traditional precedent has always been that there is a cooperative process um, that starts uh, for the capital budget where basically we are using uh, these proceeds to invest in projects across the state of Ohio. There's always been a cooperative process where both chambers get together, ideally the senators and representatives talk and compare notes from the districts saying these are good projects, maybe we, maybe we fund it at this level or that level. And when the bill is introduced, that bill is then etched in stone. And there's good reason for that. Uh, number one, it's to make sure that because any bill that's open for amendments where we're spending that kind of money in district could go off the rails pretty quickly. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're trying to be good fiscal stewards here. Um, but beyond that, it gives the predictability and it gives the assurance to the people who are named in the bill that you are going to receive this money um, and then you can start making your own decisions with the certainty that you are going to be able to uh, draw down on those funds at some point. And so that's always been the precedent. It was the precedent before I got in the legislature. It's been the precedent for the last 10 years uh, since I've been in the legislature. Um, however, uh, we, we made it a point in December in, in dealing with these projects to say, we want to go and have our project deadline at the end of April, number one, because of the one-time excess funds we had. One-time uh, strategic community investment fund, yes. $700 million. That's GRF, by the way. That's not bond money. Correct, correct. But the one-time money we had that we wanted to put back into the districts across the state of Ohio, um, there may have been a discussion at some point about how, well, you know, let's talk about this and, and maybe we'll, we'll put half towards House projects and half towards Senate projects. But my understanding and belief is that there was never an agreement that one chamber would be able to go on their own and that the other chamber would just turn a blind eye. We just rubber stamp that project. And, and, and I, you know, frankly, to do so, for us to do that and turn a blind eye to the House, and for the House to turn a blind eye to our projects would be an abdication of our responsibilities under the Constitution to have a bicameral process. And so what the process was, we laid out in December, that we would have an April 8th deadline for the projects to be submitted because the primary is early this year, obviously, um, and we wanted to make sure that we had adequate time given the amount of projects we were gonna deal with with the addition of this one-time money to be able to gather those projects and to be able to uh, really vet them in the way that they deserve to be vetted and, and provide some, some good oversight over it. 
Um, and uh, our thought was always that there would be a, a joint process between the chambers whereby we, we talk with our representatives, there's a negotiation that goes on, and maybe there's a running tally that says at the end of the day, hey, there, there might have been you know 50% of the house projects that got funded that were brought forward by representatives and maybe 50% were funded uh, by projects that were brought forward by senators, but at the end of the day, it would be a joint collaborative process between the chambers. For one reason or another, that did not happen, and so uh, my hope is that we can get back to the joint collaborative process because it's worked for so long, it's, it's really brought legislative members to the table with each other um, to better understand projects across all of their districts, and it's made it so that it's ultimately very predictable uh, and, uh, and consistent for the people who may be able to receive these and dollars. So I described it to one publication this way, much like you just did. Like, and we're talking about the OTS gift for the one-time strategic community investment fund, which is the additional 700 million on top of the normal capital budget project. So the discussion is, we'll take half of that and come up with some ideas and project ideas and, and lists. We'll come up with our list. You guys do the same thing with the other half, and then we'll get together, and then we'll vet. We'll go over that combined list, vet what projects, because some of them might be duplicative, by the way, between the chambers, and come up with the final list, and we'll add that to the capital budget project. At no point would anybody ever just give the other chamber, whether it was the Senate or the House, a blank check and rubber stamp it and say, well, that's it, with no discussion whatsoever. Well, well and it also ensures that there's a more equitable distri distribution of the funds across the state of Ohio. Because, you know, if, if, if I am in the Senate district, and there are three House districts within the Senate district, and maybe there are, are projects that I want to fund on one side of the Senate district or the other, and the representative uh, decides to go in and, and fund projects um, at a higher level, and I may have other projects within that House district that I want to see uh, receive money that may not have been on that representative's list, but if the fund has, our funds have already been taken up, um, then it would maybe cause difficulties in trying to get the funds there through a Senate version when we have to then balance the funding out over the rest of the district. And over time, I'm sure that you've heard that people in Washington County or Benton County or some of the more rural counties start to feel like if you're not in Columbus, you get nothing. And I mean, your district is more of a rural area as well, and so you're very sensitive to that topic. And that's why you work for your district and you try to make sure that if projects qualify, everybody gets something. Yeah, yep, exactly. And, and it, it has to be a, a process that is fair, a process that involves both chambers, and a process where ultimately, and this has always been my approach, I've always had a good working relationship with all of my state reps to sit down with them, go through each of our lists, come up with an agreed upon list with agreed upon appropriation ask to try and make sure that we have the greatest odds of success when the bill comes out. And that's always worked very well for us. And so I would hope we would get the same opportunity going forward. Also, uh, moving on to higher education uh, this week on the floor, the trustees for the new Miami, Miami University uh, Constitutional School. Mm -hmm. I can't think of the title. It escapes me right now. But that's something that you really uh, fought for and supported uh, trying to put this at a foundational level in higher ed because it seems more and more that uh, whether it's K through 12, you graduate with your high school diploma, or uh, young people, I still call them kids, shows the age, but that come right out of college, don't have a foundational grasp about the United States Constitution, the Ohio Constitution, or just things that you should already know uh, about how city council operates or the school board operates. So, and I think an even more concerning trend is, is not only the grasp that they have over those founding documents, but it's the inability to have an open and honest and, and civil debate about many of the concepts contained therein. And so um, we, we endeavored and we, we've, in, we've uh, funded several of these centers across the state of Ohio. 
Um, Ohio State received uh, money for one of these centers. University of Toledo College of Law received money. Miami has received money. There have been some other uh, universities that have received money as well. To form a center that is in some ways insulated from the normal operations of the university, uh, that to allow whoever it is that is running these centers um, to have a board that they that they answer to, which is what we approved this week for the for uh, Miami, and also uh, to allow that there be uh, no external pressures from within the university, because what we've seen in many of these universities is that there is a cancel culture that's developed regarding free speech, free thought, free debate of many of the concepts that traditionally have been part of the reason you go to a university is to, to uh, be exposed to differing viewpoints and, and different opinions and refine your own viewpoints and opinions while you're there. And unfortunately what we've found throughout the process is that that has been stifled over the years and in many cases it's been stifled through the faculty at these institutions. There was a study that we cited when we passed this legislation that was actually conducted by higher education, UCLA, UCLA and uh, Carnegie Mellon conducted a study that showed that there has been a dramatic rise in the last 20 years of faculty that self-identify as very, uh, very far left uh, liberals and to the point where it's also resulted in a sharp decline in those that identify as uh, conservatives. As a result of that, there's um, a, 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 a uh, overemphasized narrative, um, an overemphasis that's being put on one side of the thought debate rather than the other, often to the exclusion of the other side. And that's not how this is supposed to happen. I mean, there should be uh, an open and honest discussion, and nobody ever has the illusion that higher education is going to be right of center. Generally speaking, it never has been. But it's gotten so lopsided now that it's often uh, a hostile environment for those who may have opinions on the other side of the issue. As we learned during the public university trustee symposium that President Huffman and Senator Serino, and I encourage you to look at some of the videos on our YouTube channel and the panelists that talked about the pervasiveness of the DEI cancel culture and faculty hiring faculty. And some of the recommendations within that was you need somebody who sits outside of the president's office that can truly advise the trustees and tell them sometimes the things maybe they don't want to hear that the president doesn't want to tell them because the trustees are the ones that are really uh, on the hook or responsible for the decision making if it comes down to a big lawsuit against the, uni against the university. Yeah, no, ultimately I think one of the biggest um, eye-opening moments for those uh, attendees, those trustees from the universities who were in attendance is that um, they do not enjoy qualified immunity for some of their decisions. And so in that case, uh, they may be on the hook for some of these decisions, especially if it results in a, in a case that ends up being uh, filed against them for discriminatory hiring practices. And that's where what we've seen in some of these institutions and what we've heard from faculty who've tried to apply uh, to some of these institutions is that there are so many litmus tests that they need to go through to satisfy that they hold a, an extreme viewpoint on one side of the issue in some cases that they are completely blocked out. Uh, from day one if they're on the other side of the issue. And, and that's so. discriminatory, yeah. according to the Attorney General's, Deputy Attorney General, who came to talk about that at the symposium. Uh, final thought, um, a big brother type of a question where in Ohio on the floor this week, Senator Terry Johnson had sponsored Senate Bill 148, which prohibited the financial tracking of Second Amendment related purchases. Good bill? Absolutely. It, great bill because what we're seeing, especially from the federal level, is they're trying to use retail codes that get plugged in on credit card transactions to really track who's buying firearms or ammunition. And for years we've been fighting against a firearms registry um, across the country really um, to say that look, you have a Second Amendment right. The government has no right to monitor your First Amendment protected speech. The government has no right to monitor uh, whether you have firearms in your home for self-defense or otherwise. And so there's been an, a move uh, uh, nationally to try and use these codes uh, that are put into our, our credit card systems as a backdoor 
to find out who's purchasing firearms and ammunition. We need to be opposed to that. Frankly, we're seeing the weaponization of, of uh, the financial system, even just against lawful firearms dealers, where we've seen some of them debanked uh, by their financial institution, sometimes without notice, where they just show up and there's a cashier's check for their entire balance at, uh, mailed to their house or their office that says, you're no, longer, you're no longer going to be banked by your institution because of a decision that we made at corporate level. So. Um, that type of uh, really in some ways discrimination against those businesses for conducting lawful activity, constitutionally protected activity um, is very concerning. It's interesting how the left likes to talk about it. it's all about security and protecting the public, but really the people that are punished by this are law-abiding citizens, law-abiding Ohioans. Small business owners who are just trying to make a living in this state and support their families. State Senator Rob McCauley, thanks for your time today on the President's Podcast. Thanks, John. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you soon.